Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining FP 2020's webinar on hormonal contraception and HIV risk, understanding the ECHO trials. My name is Beth Schlachter, and I'm the executive director here at FP 2020, mm -hmm. and I want to welcome all of you and thank you for joining this important webinar. I'm sure most of you have heard the word <clears throat> ECHO trial in various conversations recently. Most of us are familiar with some aspects of it. But this webinar is our attempt to ensure that we all share a common understanding of this critical issue so we can prepare for the outcome, whatever that may be. We will also save time at the end of the webinar for you to ask questions and join the discussion. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the logistics of the webinar, and then I'm going to introduce our speakers, and then we'll get started. So before we start the program, I wanna take a couple minutes to share the logistical information with you. First, you should be seeing in front of you a presentation at the bottom, and at the bottom of the presentation are three pods. One shows a list of all attendees. A second is where you can submit questions. And the third is where you can send chats to all attendees or to us, the meeting hosts. If you would like to submit a question, we encourage you to do so at any time during the webinar through the question pod. Please use the chat or Q&A pods to reach us if you have any, any trouble with the uh, webinar itself or any other issues that you need to raise. In the event you're unable to reach us through those pods, um, you can use email, but please email us at info at familyplanning2020.org. And just as a reminder, this webinar will be recorded, including the Q&A portion. And we think that's an important point because We've had over a thousand people RSVP for this webinar. It's by far um, the highest RSVP rate we've ever had for an FP 2020 um, webinar. Um, and our chat room or our facility will only allow about 500 people in before the system becomes overloaded. So we expect that many people who expressed an interest will not be able to get into the webinar. Um, so the recording will be available for them and for anyone else who at a later date wishes to uh, have more information um, on the important ECHO trial. So with that, I'd like to introduce our distinguished speakers. We have joining us this morning, Dr. Nellie Mugo, who is a chief research officer and head of the Sexual and Reproductive and Adolescent Child Health Research Program at the Kenya Medical Research Institute, that's KEMRI. And she's also a research associate professor at the University of Washington Department of Global Health. We're also joined um, by Dr. Mugo's uh, ECHO colleague, Dr. Jared Baton, who is vice chair of the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. And he directs the University of Washington's Fred Hutchinson Center for AIDS Research. Our third speaker is my colleague here at FB 2020, Tamar Abrams. She's our communications director and for the past year, she's been clo working closely with a group of family planning and HIV communicators to prepare for the release of the ECHO trial results. So with that, I'd like to hand the webinar over to Dr. Nelly Mugo, who is going to um, share with us information on the ECHO trial. Dr. Mugo, over to you. Um, good evening uh, to those of you in the African region and good morning to members from the other parts of the continent. It's my pleasure to do the introductory part of our ECHO Consortium trial on behalf of the ECHO Consortium. And for the question of what is ECHO, it's the evidence for contraceptive options and HIV outcomes. This trial has been made possible by collective work from a large group of people, including the funders, the management committee members and implementing uh, trial sites who we'll talk about later. So the ECHO trial brings together the HIV and contraceptive world. And where we start from is that we all know and agree that safe and effective contraception is essential to the health and development of women, children, and families worldwide. I think the, the data to support this system, this statement is, 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 is um, wide and old. Uh, 
what what has also been clear is that there's a clear overlap between geographic locations where there's high use of injectable hormonal contraception and HIV prevalence. The reasons for this we cannot assume. But when you look at the global map in the red areas, those are areas where there's both high use and you see the Eastern African region, some of the mid South African region and the South African region. And you'll notice when we tell you where our trial sites are, they're also based within those localities. So what, what information do we have that has fueled the current debate? Uh, we only have observational data with 25 years, a quarter decade of epi and biological studies to determine whether there's truly increased risk of HIV acquisition associated with use of hormonal contraception. There was a landmark um, manuscript published by one of our colleagues, Rene Heffron, that, 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 <clears throat> that evaluated data from a prospective trial on the use of hormonal contraception and risk of HIV transmission and found that indeed there was an um, increased risk, but of note again, this was observational data. And we also have data from animal monkey trials. So this is not adequate to truly make a statement on whether or not there's increased risk. There's multiple other data that has led and fueled this debate. So what do we know so far? The majority of our data is on progesterone only injectables, mostly DMPA, intramuscular, which has been linked to increased HIV risk. Um, in one meta-analysis by Polis, the magnitude of effect was up to an increase of 40%. So importantly, we do not know whether DMPA use causes the increases risk, or is it other factors around users of DMPA that, um, that demonstrate the increase in risk. Uh, in, this, in, in another analysis in, on net N, there's less HIV risk than DMPA. However, there's limited data because there are fewer net N users than there are uh, DMPA IM users. On the more recent DMPA subcute, we have no data. And hormonal implants on non-hormonal IUDs and hormonal IUDs, there's very little data. As the family planning world knows, there's very little use of the long-term, these other long-term methods in the continent where there's um, high HIV epidemic rates. So in 2017, after the meta-analysis, WHO issued guidance and what that guidance stated is that women can use progestin only injectables, but they should be advised that there are possible concerns about increased risk of HIV. There's uncertainty about the causal relationship. So we do not know if it's a direct relationship or it's an incidental because of behavioral um, or other factors around users of DMPA. And that guidance also informed providers on how to minimize um, risk among women who choose to use DMPA and at increased risk of HIV. And I think what's really important here is to, to, to lay emphasis that this is among people at increased risk of HIV and two, the issue of how uncertain that relationship is. And that guidance also called for data from randomized trials. And this is where the echo trial data results come in. So we have a public health conundrum. We have data suggesting that HIV acquisition risk with some hormonal contraceptives. And we also know very well about the life-saving benefits of hormonal contraceptives. And when you look at the use, which will be told again at the end of the presentation, amongst how many people in this continent use hormonal contraceptives, we are in, in an uncertain area because 
the data on risk is also uncertain. And this is why the ECHO trial and the need to answer this challenging question with, with some level of finality. So ECHO, which was, um, which was proposed after review of all this data by people who'd worked in the field for many, many years, is a multi-center, open-label, randomized clinical trial which compares HIV incidence and contraceptive benefits in women using Depo, Provera, um, levonorgestrel implants, and copper IUDs. In, in short, we call it the evidence for contraceptive options and HIV outcomes trial. What is the study goal? <clears throat> it's to assess whether the risk of acquiring HIV differs with the use of the three different family planning methods and how that risk balances against the benefits of these methods. So it's important to note that the trial will compare amongst methods. There is no control. So we have DMPA, intramuscular, levonorgestrel implant, and the copper IUD. And we'll also have information comparatively across methods on benefits. The study design was to enroll 7,800 women wanting not to conceive and willing to be randomized. So that was quite a debate on whether or not women would be willing to be randomized to method. And as you'll see, women were willing to be randomized to method. The randomization was on a ratio of one to one to one with 2,600 women on each arm. And women came in to the study clinics every three months for a total duration of 18 months. And the primary endpoint, which was assessed at every visit was HIV infection. There were other secondary endpoints, which we mentioned at the, on the point of seeing the objective of the trial was to look at pregnancy rates across the methods, safety, looking at serious side effects across methods. And I mentioned early at the very beginning that the trial sites are located in the areas where there's high use of DMPA and where we have high HIV prevalence. So we have one clinical trial site in Kisumu, located in Kenya, where I live. We have a trial site in Zambia, um, in Lusaka, at the teaching hospital. We have a trial site in Swaziland <clears throat> at the ICAP Center. And we have nine sites in South Africa, from um, Oram, East London, Cape Town, Madibang, Mad Commercial, um, <clears throat> Ladysmith, Sashrava, and Johannesburg in Adbits and the Match Clinic. So how was this study done? Study visits, after enrollment, we had a visit at month one, which was important, especially for IUD users and other contraceptive users to determine how well the methods were sitting with them. And then the women came in every three months, as I mentioned before, for a total duration of 18 months. We had HIV testing and contraceptive counseling at every visit. And the staff at the clinical trials were well-trained and supported on use and insertion of contraceptive methods, all three methods. So women receive a very comprehensive package for both pregnancy and HIV prevention with regular counseling from well-trained providers, access to condoms. We offered partner HIV testing and we offered STI screening and treatment and we offered oral prep. Though this was done a little later into the trial as national policies allowed the use of oral prep. The trial had a lot of oversight. We had ethics committees at every study trial site. And we had qualified independent clinical monitors who regularly visited the study sites. We had a safety oversight committee 
especially on um, that, that gave oversight on contraceptive um, adverse effects and others. And they were available on 24 seven for clinical advice with regular calls. We have a global community advisory group and community advisory groups at each trial site. We had very good, um, good participatory practice plans for every site and an independent DSMB that provided overall evaluation of study output and informed us on whether to continue or not at a regular basis. So clinical trial participants were very, um, had external um, oversight. So where are we now with the trial? We enrolled successfully 7,830 women and we reached our enrollment target and completed all study visits as of 31st October 2018. And this is the question people have asked, when do you anticipate results? And this will be the middle of this year, you will have the study results for the ECHO trial. So we do not yet know the results. This is a question asked again and again. We really do not right now know the ECHO trial results. But this is the, the summary. And we've been through this before that it's a multi-center open label randomized, randomized trial with three arms of three long-acting contraceptive methods of DMPA, intramuscular, levonorgestrel implant, copper UD, who were the participants enrolled were sexually active HIV and infected women between the ages of 16 and 35 years who are seeking highly effective contraceptive and were willing and voluntarily consented to randomization to any of the three arms. So if a participant came in with a predetermined preference for any method, she was not eligible, but she would be provided access or referred to a place where she could obtain access. I want you to know that we were able to enroll women ages 16, 17, and 18 at one of our trial sites. So as I mentioned again before, the primary outcome was HIV infection, and the secondary outcomes were pregnancy, contraceptive safety outcomes, and method continuation. That was another debate at the beginning of the trial on whether or not women would remain on method for the 18 months to allow us to adequately answer these questions. And the total follow-up period for all participants was 18 months. So why did we have a randomized trial? Only a randomized clinical trial can evaluate for evidence of a causal relationship that using a particular method leads to increased risk of HIV. It will also allow us through a randomized trial to provide highest quality evidence that enables women to make fully informed choices. And I think this is important for contraceptive that whatever the echo results will be, the purpose is to provide information that allow women and providers, the clinicians, to have clear messages and information to, be, to make choices about method use. It will also offer guidance for policymakers and programs. And this will be pertinent, of course, to geographic location and HIV epidemic in each region. So when we look at ECHO and the World Health Organization's MEC classification, after the 2017 guideline for women at high risk of HIV, DMPA intramuscular was moved to MEC2. And what does that mean? It means that it moved from a method with no restrictions on use to a point two where benefits generally outweigh risk and if you remember the guidance we talked about, 
it spoke to women at high risk of HIV and measures that would be taken in the absence of understanding and certainty of information to protect them from infection. And I think it's always worth mentioning that even in the absence of DMP or any contraceptive, women at risk of HIV still require HIV prevention interventions because it doesn't, it's not the method, it's their risk that, put, um, that, 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 that leads to the HIV infection. Levonorgestrel implants remained at one and the copper IUD was from before AMEG2, especially for women at high risk of STIs, including HIV. So that did not change. What changed was the MEG status of DMPA intramuscular. So no. we I'll hand over. to my colleague, Jared Baton, who will present the second part of the trial on what the study can tell us. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank, you for, thank you for all joining this uh, conversation about ECHO. I'll continue the next few slides and then uh, there'll be good time for questions. So uh, as Nelly described, the reason for a randomized trial is to provide the highest quality evidence for women to make decisions, for clinicians to have clear messaging to inform prescribing and counseling, and for policymakers and programs to offer the best guidance possible. So ECHO is framed within that, uh, with that framework. What can it tell us? It will directly measure and compare HIV incidence as shown here with each of the arms compared to each of the other arms. So DMPA, um, injectable IM compared to the IUD, the implant compared to the IUD, and, the, and DMPA compared to the implant. That is the primary goal of ECHO and under which the trial has been designed and powered. It will also tell us about potential biologic mechanisms, which are uh, done, which will be done through nested ancillary studies, testing, um, uh, testing biologic samples from women who have volunteered to give such samples within the ECHO trial. There'll be direct comparisons of method, the continuation of the contraceptive methods for women who were assigned to each of the methods during the study, as well as the rate of pregnancy across the three methods, a direct comparison of those. Those are the major, these are some of the major questions that ECHO is going to be able to address and address through the most rigorous study design possible, a randomized trial. At the same time, however, there are several things that ECHO cannot tell us, as will be shown on the next slide. ECHO is, will not be able to describe what HIV risk may be like for women using any of the methods here compared to women using no contraception, because there is no control group in ECHO of women who are using no contraception. On the other hand, as Nellie mentioned, the women who, all women who enrolled in ECHO were those who had decided to use a contraceptive and then through a, a rigorous informed consent process had agreed to the randomization process of ECHO itself. So ECHO is most relevant to women who want to contracept at that time. ECHO also cannot tell us directly about contraceptive methods not tested in the trial. And that includes all of those listed here, but including um, oral contraceptive pills, alternative injectables, either intramuscular or subcutaneous, as well as alternative implants or IUDs. And I think importantly, ECHO, which is designed with strong statistical power to be able to see a 50% increase in HIV risk, cannot reliably be able to detect HIV risks that are smaller than about a 35% risk. And that difference between 35% and 50% uh, 
has to do with the statistical power, the statistical design of any trial like this, that in having the strong statistical power to reach to be able to see if a 50% effect is present, an effect between about 35 and 50% increased risk uh, will be likely statistically significant in the trial. I think most, most important is this point at the bottom, that ECHO is about providing information. It's about evidence. Indeed, evidence is what E stands for in ECHO. Evidence for women, for their providers, and for policymakers to make decisions. But it is not, ECHO does not provide a prescription. It helps for individuals to be making all, to be making co safe contraceptive decisions for them and for the information for clinicians and policymakers to be able to provide the best information for women to be making their best contraceptive decisions. So ECHO will tell a result. It will not tell, it will not, we will not tell exactly what to do with it. Next slide. Please. Jared, my apologies for interrupting. We've had a few requests that you please speak up a bit. Thank you. Okay. I'll try on that. So the next slide talks about what ECHO might, what, what that exactly that 50% increase means. So let's look at this slide exactly. ECHO was designed and prior to starting ECHO, the trial estimated that approximately four out of every 100 women in the study would acquire HIV each year. What does a 50% increased risk mean when we talk about looking at ECHO as a 50, looking for a 50% increased risk? That would mean instead of four out of each year on the right, that six each year on the left would acquire HIV. And as noted at the bottom, the 4% four per, four per year comes out of the rate of new HIV infections in women in previous trials where HIV has been the outcome, mostly HIV prevention trials, and that occurred in similar geographic areas as ECHO, and all of which included best HIV prevention strategies, including condoms, risk reduction counseling, treatment of STIs, and other, and other, and other HIV prevention actions like ECHO Incorporated. Next slide, please. So let's take a moment and think about some of the pot potential outcomes of ECHO. Because as Nelly mentioned, we do not know these results at this time. And I, we do not say that coyly, and we do not say that with secrecy. Part of doing a trial well is to not know the result, to be blinded as Nelly and I and other ECHO investigators are all the way until the end of the trial and until the data are fully cleaned and processed so that one does not make decisions based on information that is only part way finished. So we do not know right now. And so what we lay out for you right now are some potential outcomes that may help us understand and think through what ECHO might generate in the next few months. One of these outcomes would be no difference in HIV risk as presented here. That would, that would translate into being similar HIV rates across the three groups, across women who were assigned to DMPA, to the implant, or to the copper IUD. That is one potential outcome. And that would be informative for women, for, for their providers, and for policymakers. That is one potential outcome of ECHO. Next slide, please. On the other hand, a different potential outcome may be that there is a difference in HIV risk. And one potential difference in HIV risk would be that the DM, women who are using DMPA may have a greater than 1.5 fold HIV incidence than women either using the implant and or the IUD. This of course is the outcome uh, under which ECHO was the, sort of the driving force of ECHO to understand if DMPA, which has some evidence that it may increase HIV risk, truly does in a randomized comparison. So this is one potential outcome that, um, that ECHO has been, has been designed to measure and assess. 
It has high statistical power to see at least a 50% increase. And the observational data suggests that a 40 to maybe 50% increase may be something reasonable to be seen. So that is another potential outcome that we all must be ready for. The next slide. On the other hand, we may be surprised by an echo result. As Nellie mentioned earlier, there's very little information available to understand HIV risk associated with the use of IUDs, including the copper IUD, or implants, including the levonorgestrel implant. And so in the absence of very good information about their potential risk, we may be surprised with their actual risk in, an, in the echo result, that either of these might be the highest HIV incidence. ECHO is designed, again, to have high statistical power to show at least a 50% increase for any of the methods compared to each of the other two methods. And so we must be ready for a potential surprising result such as this. Because any of the, right now, when we do not know the results, any of these results are still hypothetically possible. Next slide, please. So where do we stand now? We've talked, through, we've talked through the trial, we've talked through potential results. We have just, a, we are now in the process of analyzing the ECHO data. We don't know the result yet. The analysis is ongoing. It is expected that results dissemination will happen in the middle of this year, uh, which we're getting very close to now. And then results will be presented to WHO uh, for a, guideline, a guidance steering group who will consider these new data and whether there needs to be made a global recommendation policy change. Next slide. So to close up, the ECHO trial has worked extraordinarily hard to contribute the highest quality scientific evidence for this important question of hormonal contraception and HIV risk. Most, most importantly, this information is needed for women so they can make an informed choice about contraception and HIV prevention, the best choice for their individual circumstance. Next slide. On behalf of the ECHO team, I'd like to thank you all for joining this. These are, this is also thanks to the funders of ECHO who are listed here. And to, uh, and to the late Ward Cates, who guided much of this work. Next slide, please. And here for additional information is the website of the ECHO Consortium. And we look forward to answering questions at the end of this, at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Jared, and thank you, Nellie. Uh, this is Beth Schlockscher again, for those of you who may have just joined. Um, at this point, I just wanted to share a bit of information around a sort of working effort to help those of you on the line, along with country partners, governments, those working in HIV and FP and providing services for women and girls to better understand the trial and to be prepared for the possible scenarios that may come through. So in February, WHO hosted a meeting in Lusaka, a range of partners. Next slide, please including uh, country partners where we see the highest relative risk for HIV. The idea there was to inform governments and a range of stakeholders about the trial and to ensure that countries are working with um, the communities in country to be ready for potential outcomes so they're best understood within the system. So the slide we're showing now shows on the left ECHO trial countries and the ones that are highlighted in blue are also FP 2020 commitment making countries. And the 14 are the, on the right are the countries that WHO is working with most closely. So an outcome of this Lusaka meeting that was also held with advocates and um, activists from FP and HIV world um, was that countries were going back with WHO and UNFPA to start to pull together task teams to prepare their government and all stakeholders in country um, for the outcome of the results that would be coming later this summer. They've done this in partnership with AVAC um, and donors, including uh, USAID and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and with FP 2020 Focal Points as an opportunity to bring together both the HIV and the FP community 
because one of the, I think, opportunities that this trial presents is to really push for integrated services in a way that has eluded both of our communities uh, for the last few decades. So if nothing else, this trial really points to gaps where that isn't happening and why women need these integrated services to be able to best assess their own relative risk for pregnancy and HIV. Um, because it's within their own bodies that they're experiencing these risks. We don't want to be in the situation of having messages that sort of pit one risk against another, when it's a woman who must decide what the best methods are for her for um, managing when and if she gets pregnant, as well as managing her own risk uh, to HIV based on her relationships. So next slide. I wanted to show you one of the slides that came from our annual report that we launched last November at ICFP, where we have a couple of slides that show method mix or method dominance within countries. We'll start with this Africa slide, because where you see orange, that's um, the, in countries where the dominant method is DMPA, and that can be DMPA intermuscular or sub-Q. Um, where you see a country that's outlined in blue, that means it's a country with method, method skew, where over 70% of um, the methods being used is just one method. So when you look at those countries, it overlays with that slide that Nellie showed early on, um, where there's an overlap of HIV risk along with high DMPA use. So what we're hoping to do is to ensure that um, communities, media, service providers, advocates, and importantly, women and girls themselves who are trying to make informed choice about their own health care understand this relative risk and are ready for whatever the message is that will come out of um, the ECHO trial. The next slide, please. So this next slide is the same concept, but it's for Asia, uh, where you will see DMPA use in, uh, in terms of high use within the method mix um, in relatively fewer countries. But what's important when you look at both of these slides together is to notice in how many countries there's a, at least a 50%, if not a saturation point of one method. So we have a lot more work to do to ensure that there's method choice for women and girls. That means improving funding for family planning, improving um, method mix within supply chains, and ensuring that systems are able to provide the counseling and the individual time with women and girls to help them make decisions about which contraceptive method to use. So next slide, please. So I wanna land on a few key messages out of, um, out of this work. The first again is around um, integrated programming. It is well beyond time that that happened and that women's holistic needs are considered within healthcare systems and that we do all we can, particularly from a donor side as well, to ensure that we're driving for integration and not pulling health systems apart. We also know that more funding is needed to ensure method mix because it's through method mix that we get to method choice. And then when it comes to a woman and girl, it's informed choice that's so critical um, at all times, but particularly now for women who are going to have to weigh um, these considerations within their own lives and their own bodies. So again, a full range of contraceptive methods, well-trained providers who have the time to talk with each woman and girl about their relative risks so that they can make informed decisions for themselves, and that healthcare systems themselves have a human rights-based approach to providing high-quality healthcare, um, and that's at the center of all programs. We want to make sure that all training is sufficient. We know that that is still a reach in many places, but where we know that there is not um, time for informed counseling, that we need to make sure that we're weighing that against the risk of, um, of the services that are provided for all women and girls. And then what's really critical is that women themselves are a part of all of these discussions and in the outcomes of the healthcare that's provided as well. So from the ECHO design that included um, women as part of that consortium from the very beginning to working through country teams now to ensure that women are working with governments and all stakeholders to prepare the system for the best possible outcomes, we want to continue to promote that women be included in all aspects of these conversations. And then we want to end with an important message around DMPA itself, that it's a highly effective, widely used method. We know in some places that it's the dominant method, 
Um, and that that's sometimes why women are using it because it's the method that's most effective that's on choice. But we want to ensure that a range of methods are there and that regardless of the outcome, that DMPA is still considered a safe and effective method if that's what the study shows and that women are able to choose to use it. Um, not all women will be at high risk for HIV. Some women are already HIV positive. Others are still wanting to use DMPA, recognizing that there's going to be an increased risk. So we want to ensure that the results of this trial are understood within the context of method choice and that women are empowered as an end result of all of this. So now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Tamar Abrams, um, to talk about uh, communications and advocacy efforts uh, to ensure that we're ready for the trial results. Tamar, over to you. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I am most interested, next slide, I'm most interested in number one, being brief so there's more time for Q&A, and number two, impressing upon everyone that we shouldn't wait until the results come out to be saying things. Now is the time. We have three months to prepare for the results. And as you're doing here today and attending this webinar, I encourage you to educate your own stakeholders about the ECHO trial now and not wait until the results are released. The education can come in the form of sending them the link to this webinar. We're going to show you some resources online including the ECHO Consortium website, where you can direct people for more information. We also encourage you to work with others in your community, both from the family planning and from the HIV community, to align your messaging and advocacy strategies. Being aligned means that everyone is coming from the same place of women-centered healthcare, and that's important. Don't feel that you have to recreate or create initially messaging and strategies. A lot of this already exists and in some of the resources you'll see in the next slide. There are places you can go and use, use these resources rather than creating things from scratch. Do think about who your spokespeople will be when the results come out and make sure that they're as educated and prepared as they can be. And the next to last point is important. What is your unique contribution to the discussion? Are you a woman with specific information about contraception or dual protection? Are you an organization that works with women? Are you a researcher? Are you a government official? Try to figure out what your unique contribution is because the more voices adding to the discussion once the results come out, the better. And I just wanna say in the discussions at the communications level, there's generally one person who says, oh, this is terrible, what are we going to say? The results may be awful. From a communication standpoint, the ECHO trial provides us with a unique and wonderful opportunity to reframe how we talk about contraception, how we talk about protection, how we talk about women and what women want and need. So I hope you'll consider this a good opportunity. We don't have to respond to the results only. This is an opportunity to reframe family planning, to integrate messages of protection, and to recommit ourselves to ensuring that women and girls are at the center of everything we do and say. So the last slide is a list of great resources. The first one, results for informedchoice.org, has a collection of materials, of research, of messaging, of strategies across a wide spectrum of organizations. I urge you to go there, click on the resources section, and take and use everything that's applicable to you. And then these other resources are equally wonderful for different reasons, but please use them because they'll save you a lot of time and a lot of research. Thank you. Now let's send it back to Beth. 
Thank you, Tamara. And I'm going to moderate the Q&A from this point forward. And we've received a lot of questions. Some we were able to answer um, in the chat um, queue along the way, but others were pulling together here now so we can um, organize them into, into sort of groupings of questions. And if I could ask you to go back a slide, please. So let's leave up the contact details so that people can be sure to um, have access to to where the resources are. Um, so before we go into it, I did wanna raise one point as well, which is sort of the process this summer uh, for when the results will be released. So at this point, as Nellie, I believe mentioned, we, we anticipate that the trial results will come out sometime around mid-July. At that point, WHO will have 24 hours to see the results and they will issue a statement about the trial itself, and then the trial will just be publicly available. But WHO themselves, as those of you who are familiar with their processes, they have their own internal review committees that take between three to six or potentially even nine months uh, before they come out with guidelines uh, based on the trial. Um, that's the point at which um, the MEC, the medical eligibility criteria, could potentially be changed depending on what um, the WHO uh, review process determines. But there will be this gap period between when the trial um, results are available and when we have WHO guidance. So that's one of the things that we wanna highlight for all of you is that being prepared through you know, sort of counseling programs that uh, provide information for both HIV and family planning are going to be really critical and essential so that women have access to the best information to help us through this period before that we'll have a potential MEC revision uh, based on, on the trial results. So with that, I'm gonna ask or pose a few of the questions. Uh, Nellie and Jared, these are mostly for you. Um, so I'll, we've tried to group them together. Um, the first I'm gonna ask is, what are the ethical issues around ages 16 to 18 um, that you dealt with? And what were the challenges of working with 16 to 18 year olds um, like relocation to other places. So I think really they want to know how you were able to work with 16 to 18 year olds and if there were um, ethical challenges within that. Mm, I, I can probably take that up. <laughs> so one of our sites, actually the Kenyan site, was able to enroll girls under the age of 18, but that's because our ethics review committee and our reproductive health guidance allows women that age who are called emancipated minors have had a previous pregnancy or are married to make decisions for themselves. So, so that, was, that would be the ethical concern in some other regions, which would, would, in other regions, they may have been required to get parental consent. So for this trial site in Kisumu, they were able to get girls who were emancipated minors to enroll in the trial. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Nellie. And will the echo results be age disaggregated? Um, I'm gonna ask Jared to take that question. Yeah, yeah. the echo results will be age disaggregated. Um, the, uh, probably the, the best break will be about, uh, about at the average age of the trial, which is in the about 24, 25. So we will, ha we will be able to look at younger uh, the the DMPA uh, implant IUD effects in younger versus uh, slightly older younger women in in echo. Thank you. Others are asking about um, the impact of prep and condoms and the counseling that people were offered as they were randomized onto a contraceptive method. Could you talk a bit about that, please, and about um, the impact that PrEP or condom use might have had on the trial results um, and what you expect from that? You know, and I know um, the ethics committees very often, I mean, I can say this for all the HIV prevention trials that I've been involved in, where there's an HIV infection outcome, it's a, it's a question people ask. They say, well, you need to see HIV infection. So what does it mean that you're putting in all these measures to protect people from HIV? I think one, I'd like to say it's an ethical obligation. We, we couldn't possibly work with people who we know to at high risk of HIV and fail to provide them with information or services to reduce their risk. 
And then beyond that is where you can measure the differences in risk. If, if I want to also say again, if condoms, if people use condoms as they should, this epidemic could have been managed, but people don't use condoms like we'd like them to for their HIV prevention. Then the, the third item would be that the aim of the randomization is for, the, for, for this use of this different, um, because they, they, there'll be a cross age for all three um, arms of the study. Um, so that the behavior hopefully should be distributed, but this will be one of the items for analysis. And, and Jared, please add some more. I think, I think, I think Nellie's points were spot on. Um, condoms and risk reduction counseling and treatment of STIs and, and offers of testing and treatment for partners were part of every visit for every woman in ECHO across all of the arms. Uh, and PrEP, um, PrEP has evolved during the course of the ECHO study, but by the end of the ECHO trial, all uh, women at all sites had access to PrEP, either on-site or through local community-based organizations, which we are something that we're very proud of in ECHO, that women had best prevention services. And that would be across all arms. Because the trial is randomized, all of those effects should be balanced across the arms and do not thus undermine the rigor of the trial itself, and at the same time, as Nellie said, gave every woman the best prevention options that she could choose from, um, best for, for HIV prevention options she could choose from during the entire course of the trial. Thank you, Nellie and Jared. We've had numerous questions um, around um, DMPA sub Q and why it was not included in the trial. Can you please speak about that and let us know if there's plans for another study that would include DMPA sub Q? Maybe I'll start on this one. That there are, uh, there, are, there are, there at one point I think we had an echo trial that maybe had twelve different contraceptives in it because there are so many important questions that could have been answered. Um, and in the end, it was it the focus for the three methods chosen was the DMP. DMP obviously I am because of its dominance use in the observational data ahead of time, and then two very strong, uh, highly active, very safe, long-acting reversible methods as, as the additional two methods in ECHO. DMPA sub-Q at the time that ECHO was designed um, was, uh, was used less. It's, of course, being used more, and there and the choice between which arms to use was a, was a factor of what could reasonably be done. Um, what will follow for DMPA sub-Q uh, depends on how the ECHO results are interpreted. DMPA sub-Q currently is grouped with DMPA IM in the, in the WHO's MEC, um, but a, a guidelines group will have to weigh whether that grouping is the same or is different. I think regardless, as Beth said so clearly, uh, ECHO is designed to provide information for women to make choices among the options that they may want, which would include for the, I think going forward, uh, DMPA IM and DMPA sub Q as options, uh, regardless of whatever the ECHO results have. So I think further studies of potentially studies of HIV, but also studies of how to best message and help and help provide the information so women can make informed and best for them choices would probably be the next steps. Over. Thank you, Jared. And I'm going to build on that last point with another really explicit question because I think it's important that this question get asked and that you, you or Nellie answer it clearly, which is, is there a possibility that the association is so strong as to recommend a total withdrawal of a method, even if used with condoms? If so, how ethical is it to wait until the MEC is changed? Well, I, I'll, I'll say something and I'll let Jared add to this. I think one, I reiterate that for, for the trial, for us as the people conducting the ECHO trial, we will not determine the next steps or how the results will be translated. The second is that the issue is around P 
people at increased risk of HIV. And I think like the whole of Northern Africa, the whole of Asia, where there's still use of DNPA, HIV prevalence and incidence is extremely low. And then there's also the group of people, as you had mentioned, Beth, who are HIV infected. So the, again, just to say that that decision will not come from the trialists, but there are other consideration for other populations, even if there was a high you know, increased risk for whom this result would not, um, would not have, a withdrawal of method perhaps would be harmful, but it's not for me or the trialist, I think, to translate that result. Um, over to and Jerry. I, and I, no, I think I would say very much the same. Uh, ECHO is providing information, ECHO will provide for, for information to make these decisions. But I would, like Nelly said, emphasize that there are many women, there are many parts of the world, but there are many women, even in high HIV prevalence settings, for whom DMPA is the right op, it may be their, the choice that they would like to have. Um, women and for whom an increase in HIV risk may be uh, not immediately relevant if they have our HIV already, or if it is mitigated. If they're a woman using PrEP, if they're a woman who is in a monogamous relationship with a partner who is known to be HIV negative, et cetera. What we need to provide, like Beth said very strongly, is the ability for, is options so that, into, so that women can make the best choices for contraception for them. But ECHO will provide information to be providing for guidance. Thank you both. And I think this next question builds on that a bit more as well. Um, person wants to know, since findings will be applicable to HIV uninfected women at high risk, can the speakers address how, quote, high risk is, will, or should be defined? That, I think that's that's been... That's always been a funny question. I remember sitting in a WHO meeting, you know, when we come, when we use the high risk for PrEP, they talk about um, populations where incidence is up to 3%. But we know that ri risk differs. Even within a geographic location, you can have um, settings where little groups have higher risk than, than other groups. So in the PrEP world, where Jared and I have done um, most of our work, there are criteria um, for women for risk. And I, I'll let Jared maybe expand more and comment more on that. It, it's something that, that will, the contraceptive world will have to start learning and thinking about evaluating uh, contraceptive, women seeking contraceptive for HIV risk. Uh, yes, this is this uh, the defining defining what defining and quantifying risk is a great challenge everywhere, um, and the prep field uh, has worked on this a, quite a bit in the last several years. And I, there, I saw one of the questions come through to the, asking what is prep, and prep is pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, medication that one can take to prevent HIV. And the PrEP field has tried to define women, to try to define persons at high risk for HIV as living in a place or in a group in which their chances of getting HIV would be at least 3% per year, maybe a little bit lower than that as well. Um, and figuring out how to operationalize that is uh, not completely easy, but sometimes it, it's based on having an STI, having other behavioral risks such as partners or lack of condom use being, uh, sometimes it's age differential because HIV in many settings does uh, have greater incidence at certain ages, usually younger ages than older ages. And then individually talking with, with, with women to figure out their own life situation. And there are ways to there are ways through individual counseling discussions to try to have individuals figure out what what their risk is because they know their situation best. And I think as Beth mentioned, uh, Beth mentioned nicely in one of her slides, 
ECHO is a clarion call to bring together HIV prevention and reproductive health and sexual reproductive health services to optimize best total prevention services uh, in both family planning and HIV prevention and STI prevention. And I think we'll be all working together um, in this next period to make sure that every individual has the best uh, prevention options they can have. Thank you both. We've had a number of questions as well from, uh, from Asia asking, uh, given the DMPA use and other methods as well, including the high use of IUDs and the potential that there could be a sort of surprise finding, has there been any conversation around expanding the trial to Asia um, specifically? And then how should countries who are not a part of the ECHO trial interpret the results for use within their populations? Can you please answer those? Thank you. I, I really like Jared to answer the question about translation of results, because he's very stats oriented, more than I am. He's a medical doctor, but more stats oriented. The, um, I, love, I, I love the question about expanding the, the, the echo trial is is over um, in terms of its data collection, and it's we've run this we've run this marathon out. I think there's no expanding it uh, to additional settings now. Echo was done uh, in, um, as mentioned before, echo was done in four countries where there is both. Uh, high use of uh, where there's good use of contrast of family planning of many types, but including high use of DMPA and where HIV risk is great. And that um, means that the results are would be immediately relevant to where the set, to where the trial was done. But ECHO is also will also be hopefully immediately relevant to providing information to similar settings and then similar populations. The goal of doing any sort of work like this is to make sure that it that the work is generalizable so is is can, speaks to other settings as well so other countries particularly in east and southern africa and some degree in to some degree in central and west africa that have uh that have high hiv burdens and and have and are making family planning decisions uh, at the individual or the policy level echo will speak to those settings Similarly, for places where there is perhaps uh, lesser HIV burden, ECHO still will speak biologically um, to, to, for, for women at risk of HIV. And I think ECHO is providing information for directly to inform, as Nellie mentioned before, the global WHO medical eligibility for contraception, which is for the world, for women who are at risk of HIV, no matter where they might live. And again, it provides the information so that women can be making an informed decision and policymakers can help uh, provide the information to guide that decision making. Over. Thank you. And now I have a couple of more technical questions about how the trial itself was um, comprised. The first is what type of HIV tests were used to screen and diagnose HIV in study participants? And the second is, did you collect information on women's sexual activities, their marital status, or partner HIV status during the trial period? So yes to that second question, all of those things, be, uh, sexual behavior, marital status, partner, uh, partner information, including partner HIV status, all of that information was collected both at entry into the study and then uh, periodically during the study. And that will be part of uh, the initial analyses and as well as subsequent analyses from ECHO to understand uh, behavior. HIV testing, uh, HIV testing was done through standard uh, country approved HIV rapid tests. ECHO um, did two tests at every visit in parallel, two different tests. Each woman had two different HIV tests done. Um, at the same time, which is a little bit more testing than, H than sequential testing that many countries have as their standard algorithm. And then confirmatory testing, if there was, uh, if the rapid test suggested that an individual may have acquired HIV, confirmatory testing was done through uh, rigorous 
in lab testing, including HIV RNA and sometimes DNA PCR, HIV Western blot, as well, and, and HIV EIA. So, all, and all HIV endpoints in ECHO have been uh, reviewed uh, separately from any consideration of randomization arm by an endpoints committee to be sure that, uh, that the results are accurate. Thank you. The next question, I'll read slowly, it's a little complex. To what extent would behavioral factors be eliminated in the eventual findings? Is the increased risk a function of composition of DMPAIM, process of administration, or changes in hormone levels? Yeah, I'll, I'll start on this one and, and, and Nelly can comment further. Um, the ECHO trial, by being a randomized trial, hopes to balance differences such as um, baseline behavioral differences that might be by, that might differ across women across the study arms so that one can interpret the results of ECHO as being from the contraceptive method and not as a result of the contraceptive method and not, not in the observational data that has preceded it as a result of individual decision-making that might be tied to choice of contraceptive method. There, we will look very carefully in ECHO to understand if if being on these different contraceptive methods results in different behavioral choices once the contraceptive method is initiated, and that will be part of the ECHO results as well. In the end, the ECHO trial, by being a randomized trial, hopes to provide the most rigorous assessment of this question that can possibly be done so we can really understand if DMPA or implant or IUD is directly related to increasing one's susceptibility, one's risk of HIV. Nellie, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that that's answered most of it. The only thing I could add, if indeed the method induces behavior change that, that increases risk, then that perhaps that would be an inherent risk of the method itself. Um, beyond that, I think the randomization platform, as Jared has, has stated, um, gives us an even playing ground to compare if everybody started the same and then they were all given these different methods, will their HIV outcome differ? Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to put two other questions together as well around decisions on the trial. Why wasn't the trial conducted in a high DMPA use, low HIV country? And can you say more about why the three contraceptive methods were chosen for the trial? Why these three particular methods? So the, th yeah, it's a, it's the, the three methods chosen is a great question. And as I uh, somewhat jokingly said before, there was a point when ECHO was being designed where the, the, cons the global consortium of, per of, of of us who was designing ECHO had listed nine or 12 different contraceptive methods that could have been tested in ECHO. And obviously that would have been uh, so unwieldy of a trial that one could not, that it could not be done. Um, in the end, the methods that were chosen for ECHO, DMPA is the, obviously the driver of the, of, of ECHO because it is the, method for which there was the greatest amount of observational data to suggest a potential increase in HIV risk. And so that was absolutely included, DMPIM included in the ECHO trial. The IUD and the implant were chosen and the specific IUD and the specific implant that have been part of ECHO were chosen because they are long acting, highly effective contraceptive methods. They would provide a, essentially equivalent pregnancy uh, prevention as DMPA in uh, IM. Um, so that all of them provide very, very high uh, pregnancy prevention and are very, very safe contraceptives. And so 
they the echo team and the, in consultation with ethics committees and and community representatives and other independent scientific review felt that that provided every woman in the trial regardless of what uh, method she was assigned to a safe and highly effective contraceptive which is really what um, when all the women in echo wanted they wa they came into the trial wanting a safe and highly effective contraceptive um, the for the first question of why echo was not done in a high dmpa low hiv country uh, is principally one uh, it's, it's somewhat a one of efficiency to do such a study as echo in a in a in a country where hiv is much much less common would would require an, a, a much, much larger trial than ECHO, um, but also because the most important thing in any clinical trial, including ECHO, is that the results are immediately relevant to individuals who participated in the trial. And in the four study countries in which ECHO was done, where DMPA is highly used and HIV risk is sadly uh, great, the results are immediately relevant to, that, to those populations. Thank you, Jared. And a quick follow on is what, maybe a quick for me, but longer for you to answer. What was the logical reason behind not having a control arm in ECHO? Yeah, that's a, I'll just take this because it's a natural follow on to the last question. The, the, it would, it would be extraordinarily hard. I, I think that when, when designing ECHO, uh, there was a moment of consideration of whether there could be a control arm both ethically and, um, and logically, I think it's very, it's very difficult to have a control arm. Women coming into ECHO sought highly effective contraception. It would not be ethical or logical to provide a placebo contraceptive, um, uh, a full control arm to women who are participating in ECHO because that's what they were seeking. In addition, when one extends beyond ECHO, to policy and programs and individual women's decision making, ECHO speaks to women who are seeking, con who want a, to contracept. And when women want to contracept, nothing is not an effective, is not an effective option for her to choose from. So ECHO puts forward three highly effective, highly safe contraceptive methods and measures the degree of HIV risk associated with each of those. Thank you, Jared. I've been collecting as well a number of questions that are around efforts to work with countries, policymakers, communities, prepare communication strategies, and about what everyone's doing to try and prepare um, people for the information that's to come. So this effort is, is one such effort, obviously. Um, and I'll talk about it in 2020, and then maybe Jared and Nelly, you can talk about echo processes as well, what's been done from that end. So I, I started our conversation early with mentioning this meeting in Lusaka that was convened by WHO. And from that meeting, it was agreed that in those 14 high prevalence countries, that WHO in partnership with UNFPA would be going back to convene a meeting with governments to say, you know, this trial is coming, here's what it's looking at, here are the potential outcomes of the trial, and we think you should have a task force or some sort of steering committee to work with stakeholders to be prepared for potential scenarios and outcomes. So that work is underway. Um, there are a range of other partners who are waiting to support those efforts in countries for FB 2020. Of course, our focal points are um, aware of this and have been included in those um, discussions and we're asking that they be included in these strategies and programs going forward so that we can best reach FP stakeholders. We know that HIV um, stakeholders and countries are also being included, but um, that sort of WHO UNFP led convening process is really sort of running through this week. Once those task teams are up and going, we expect that um, all partners will be looking to support those efforts as best they can to ensure that they're far reaching and that they include women, girls, adolescents in the process so that we're you know, sort of developing policy and response along with them. And a key component of that is working with the media as well 
so that they're prepared and understand the range of potential outcomes to try to mitigate sort of knee-jerk reactions to the information that might come out and that instead, you know, that we're looking at these um, through a scientific lens, which I know can be rather complicated when it comes to the media, and particularly with a study that's as complicated as this. So those efforts are underway. We have between now and the middle of July, when the study is anticipated to be released, to try to continue to work through that, um, that system. For FP 2020, we have a reference group meeting uh, in two weeks here in uh, Washington and ECHO is on the agenda. So we will be uh, spending a considerable amount of time uh, talking with the reference group. And we've also um, invited uh, a, um, the HIV HC uh, activists to come and speak with the reference group along with FP advocates um, from partner countries as well. The government of Kenya will be um, there on the reference group, they'll be there. Kenya is sort of, um, out in front of the other trial countries in terms of this uh, country-led process to be prepared for the outcome of the results. So we'll be asking Kenya to brief on their process as well. And um, we're trying to share all of this information publicly with as many partners as possible. Therefore, the resources that you see that are listed here. There's also an important um, grant through uh, Breakthrough Action at Johns Hopkins CCP. It's, I believe it's a USAID uh, process and they're leading on um, sort of a communications roadmap and ensuring that we're mapping partners um, to make sure everybody has this information now to start activating in their channels. Um, there's a communications community of practice between HIV and um, FP uh, stakeholders that are meeting in a couple of weeks in New York to work through communications channels as well. And then we are having our um, focal point workshop for Anglophone Africa. We do this workshop every 18 months um, for each region. It just happens to fall for Anglophone Africa in May, which is good timing. Echo will be um, featured prominently on that workshop. So that workshop at this point is gonna feature 18 countries who are sending country teams comprised of government, donors, civil society, and youth advocates, along with technical experts. And they'll spend a week looking at a range of country issues, but again, ECHO will be front and center on that agenda. So there are a number of things that are taking place. There are a range of other partners as well who are working on this. Um, PAI and other partners who have you know, strong advocacy links, advanced family planning, are working through their channels as well. And we know that in-country, country partners are also driving this. Um, so you can expect to hear more, I think, from all levels now that this is sort of kicking into high gear. Um, and then the last point I'll make is uh, around a question that we had on DMPA IM um, being recently introduced into India and asking what the process is there to ensure that the government of India is aware. Um, I happen to have been in India two weeks ago for a data consensus meeting um, with the government and with Track 20, and there we spent considerable time talking about ECHO as well. And I know that Dr. Sikdar, who's the head of the family planning program, last week was in, was in um, the week before in Geneva with WHO where he received a briefing on this. The government is aware. And additional Secretary uh, Jelan Jelani will be joining the reference group. So he will be uh, with us here in two weeks time to be a part of this discussion. So there have been multiple efforts at, at many levels uh, to ensure that the government of India is, is very well aware of this as they seek to expand um, DMPA within the public sector in India. So I think I've covered the range of questions that came in on that, but I want to turn it over to Nelly and Jared and see if you have any other comments that you want to make around sort of preparation um, for, for sharing this information now and helping all partners to be prepared for the trial. I think we're having um, a bigger challenge. Oh, oh no, that's okay. No, I was going to hand it over to Jared um, because there are plans for ECHO, but I, I'd like him to speak to, to the yeah. plans for dissemination. Uh, no, so uh, the, we, we either of us could speak to this. The ECHO team is completely committed to, to disseminating this information transparently and publicly and on time when we get it and can fully process it. Um, that, so... And that will be engaging at all levels. Um, and for the ECHO team, that starts first with 
the participants in the trial and their communities and then uh, radiates out from there to, at each of the countries where the work was done with the with their uh, both media and with and with the, the ministry uh, the relevant ministries to um, as well as then uh, global entities like FP2020 and of course WHO who's part of the ECHO consortium. Um, so that the information from ECHO will be clear, the, infor the information that we're providing, the evidence that we're providing will be clear, will be clearly presented and so that, in and we'll, we'll be, have lots of opportunity for individuals to be asking questions. Great, thank you, Jared. And one last question. We have somebody who wants to play um, devil's advocate, which is always appreciated. Um, they ask, increasing method choice and improving counseling has been a part of all FP programming for decades. Isn't this message going to fall flat with governments and other stakeholders? How do we actually move the needle? And, you know, that's at the heart of this, isn't it? We've all been mm -hmm. frustrated with the lack of integration of programs and looking for something that's going to inspire that change. There's a lot of historical reason for why there's been that separation that's well understood. Um, so it is frustrating to not have a better message than that, that after all these years, we're still, and I, I loved your phrase, Jared, issuing this clarion call that now is the time to do this. Um, we're trying to look at ECHO as an opportunity in addition to being a potential challenge, that this really demonstrates better than ever why we need integrated programming. So yes, there's a potential that that message falls flat, but it remains critical and it remains at the heart. And so we will continue to drive that home. And I can say that from um, the perspective of the, the donors who've been at the table for this and trying to drive for change, that USCID for programming, we can in terms of a sort of a sea change with regard to integrated programs and in addition to what's already happening through teams, which I hope will demonstrate um, that when you have this kind of integrated programming that you have better outcomes for the well-being of adolescent girls. Um, but we will just continue to beat that drum and, uh, and hope that this is, is a moment where we have some um, some change in that regard. So Jared and Nellie, I wanna give you um, a last chance to um, offer any last messages uh, before we close the, the webinar for the day. So back over to you both. Thank you for your, th thank you everyone for your interest. Thank you, uh, uh, Beth and everyone at FP2020 for organizing this. And I do, I do hope regardless of the results of ECHO that this will be a clarion call for, the, for optimal integration of FP and HIV prevention services so that everyone can have the, every woman can have the best choice for what works for her. Thank you. Um, I also want to echo the same message. One, to thank everybody who's come on to this webinar, listened through, been uh, interacted and sent their questions. I think the, the time for integration, the, the time for integration of HIV and reproductive health is truly, truly long overdue. The, the, the data on HIV incidence amongst young women has been out there for a long time. So I think for, I'm a reproductive health, primarily that's my field, but for us not to pay attention to the HIV risk amongst the people that we take care of is, is a thing that we can address now, no matter what the results are. So I think beyond the policy makers, we, at the level of providers, at the level of policy and program, each one of us can make a difference. And we can use this um, as the stepping stone to, to make that difference and make it happen and actually provide better health. Thank you. Thank you, Nellie, and thank you, Jared, and thank you to Tamara, and many thanks to all of you online. This has been a great conversation. Thank you for the really engaged participation. We had somebody just write in and say, thank you, I don't regret the time. So that's, I think, high praise for a webinar, um, and we'll end on a high note there. And please know that here at FP2020, uh, the reason we exist is for better collaboration and communication through partnership. So please do let us know what more we can be doing from your perspective 
to effectively um, help all partners be prepared for um, a positive response to whatever the, out, the, tri the ECHO trial um, determines. Um, we have time now between um, when the, now and when the trial is released in July to do our best to ensure that everybody is well informed and prepared and we stand it, you know, here ready in partnership with all of you uh, to do the best we can with the time that we have at hand. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day or good evening if you're in East Africa or in Asia. Uh, and we look forward to the next time that we'll be together or have a chance to work with all of you. Thank you and goodbye. Mm -hmm.